Hello dear friends, brothers and sisters, welcome to Oats of Love Sunday Worship. My name is Apostle and Bible teacher Nandi Naram of Fountain of Life International. It's such a joy and delight to be with you this Sunday morning. Uh, normally this is not where we do service, uh, but today's a little different. I had to uh, make an impromptu uh, trip to North Carolina, um, so I had to pre-record the service to serve the purpose uh, of the of our, our broadcast. Um, we had a situation come up in North Carolina, an emergency that I need to address or attend to. Um, so please keep me in your prayers. We had a, a sister who was very dear to our family who were home to know the Lord on Friday morning. And uh, we, um, so I, I'm going to North Carolina to pay a visit to the family to encourage them and uh, comfort them and be with the family for, you know, for, for a day or so. Uh, so please keep me your prayers as to travel. I'll be back tomorrow. That's Monday. So keep me your prayers as travel to go with, to go and be with this family. Okay. Thank you in advance. So today's gonna be a little different. We normally we have with we start with music and worship, but today we're not doing that. So uh, rather than go that route today, I'm just gonna get into prayer and then get into God's word, and uh, we'll we'll do some stuff together. Amen. Thank you again for joining us. This is Apostle and Baptist Channel in the Rome of Fountain of Life International. This is of Love Sunday Worship. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We give you praise this morning. We thank you, Father, for loving us. Thank you for your care. Thank you, Father, for all that Jesus Christ did on the cross for us. Thank you, Father, that we are your sons. We are your daughters. We, are, we have the spirit of sonship. In Christ, thank you, Lord God, for we are members of the household of faith. Thank you for a wonderful week. You've been good to us. You've sustained us. You've kept us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for sheltering and providing for us. Lord, we give you praise this morning. Oh, Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you. Even as we're about to get into your word today, Lord, I ask that you grant unto us spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of you, that the eyes of our understanding may be enlightened. And we'll know the hope of our calling, we'll know the riches that we have in Christ, and we'll know the power of work in us. Holy Spirit, I ask that illuminate everyone today. Let your word come forth with simplicity, with clarity, but yet with power. Thank you, Father God, in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm also outside. As I said, let me have this for the ambience of today so you can hear nature, all the birds chirping and all the stuff going on, the crickets and all the, the natural sounds as it were. You know, so I uh, just want to share this moment with you. Um, well, the, in the month of August, we were dealing with uh, extensive. We took time to to address um, dress. We call it dress to bless. We took time to address this concerning dressing and clothing and uh, the armor of the believer. And there was one of them that we never really um, got to touch. But this one is a little expansive. So it, even though we did not touch it, it's it's good that we came into September and we have enough time to deal with it. Uh, many of the subject matters we dealt with in, in August where we just kind of went in and worked on them, you know, um, um, in, within a certain construct. We didn't really get to unpack them as much as I would have loved to. So as the months go by, we're going to, by the Spirit, by the help of God, we're going to unpack certain things in scriptures that, that we dealt with in the month of August. Amen. So um, get ready for that. Okay. So uh, in September, we're starting with dealing with prayer. You know, so uh, our focus of the month of September is going to be understanding prayer. Okay, we, uh, Amen. I love that. That's our focus for the month of September: understanding prayer. Okay, what is prayer about? What different types of prayer and all that stuff. We're going to deal with that throughout the month of September. So September is our month to understand prayer. Now let's let's kind of dive in. Let's go to Luke chapter eleven. I'm going to be on teaching today for about forty-five minutes or so. So, um, just uh, tell you that to prepare your mind for that 45 minutes. Do me a favor, <laughs> as I always ask. Please, right now, click like and share. Share it on all your platforms or your, you know, um, with your friends. Send the link to them. Uh, I, I, and I always say this, that every time we do these messages, we are, we take time to teach. We're teaching ministry. We take time to teach the Word of God. We, well, this is our, our desire is that you get understanding, not just get religious, but get understanding concerning these truths in Scripture, so that way you can walk in the riches of understanding, you can actually live it out. So what you don't understand, generally speaking, you're not very confident in handling. 
Think about it. If someone tells you uh, there are two bottles here, one of them is water, the other one is acid. I'm not sure which one is which. Go ahead and drink. Trust me, you're not going to touch any of them because you don't understand. You're not sure. Now, but if one of them is not labeled at all, okay, and it's open, the other one is labeled as water, and it's, it's sealed. You can drink that one because you understand. You can see the seal. You can see it's sealed. You can also see the label that says this is spring water or pure water. Whatever you want to call it. It's still water. You know, you drink it because you see that. It's, it's, so that understanding allows you to come into enjoying that benefit of water. Same thing when it comes to God and, and, and things of the kingdom of God. When you don't understand, you are less likely to partake or participate in even if you do it, you do it out of duty, not out of understanding, not out of the uh, free will, the conscious of a free will. So one of the things that we try to do as much as possible is to make sure we teach properly. When I say we teach on the Word of God, of course, teach properly, rightly dividing the Word of Truth, so that way you can gain understanding and gain confidence in God and in His Word. So that's very important. So I just said, let me share that in advance. So let's look at Luke chapter 11. What am I saying? What am I saying? Go ahead and share it. Invite somebody else to join and be a part of this experience or be a part of the service. Send them the link and let somebody else participate. Let somebody else be blessed. Okay, Luke chapter 11. Luke 11, verse, let's start from verse 1. Okay, Luke 11, verse 1. It says that, And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray. As John also taught his disciples. Okay, let's stop here. Let's let's work on these verses. So they saw Jesus praying, and when he sees praying, they said, "Lord, teach us to pray." Now, why were they so? That means were curious about prayer, because they had seen results in the ministry of Jesus. They had seen Jesus pray. They had seen great results in the ministry, in the ministry of Jesus. Sometimes the reason why some people don't want to learn how to pray the way we pray is because they have, we have not. They have not seen results of answered prayers in our lives. And therefore, they're not so eager to ask us to pray. See, if, if people don't see results in your life or in my life, then they're not going to be eager to say, hey, pray for me, or, you know, and all that. But in this case, these were disciples. So these were not just members. So they're not just friends. So they're just family members. These were disciples. That means they're students. Okay? They're like students in a school. They're watching their teacher or their master a professor have success. They're going to ask the professor to teach them. I remember one time, I went into a class for trading. I was trading Forex and all that kind of stuff. And the gentleman was teaching us. At the beginning of the class, the man set his, you know, set his trades up as it were, the way, you know, was teaching us to do, set up his trades in the class. When the class was over, he went back to the trade and showed us how he had made like $13,000 in about four or five hours of teaching. Okay. So while he was teaching us, he you know, he had a great successful trade and showed it to us. I made all this money while I'm teaching you guys. So you guys came, you saw me when I said the trades, and now you've seen all this is fulfill the charts and all that kind of stuff. So so what happens is that that motivated us the students to say, hey sir, please teach us how to trade. That's what happened to the apostles also. Disciples rather. They saw Jesus and they saw the success he had and said, Lord, teach us to pray. Just like John taught his disciples. We are your disciples. We don't just want to watch you pray. We want to learn how to pray. Okay? And that's important. That you as a believer, you don't go, you go beyond religion. You go beyond just a form. You go into actually knowing how to do stuff. What they're saying to Jesus, teach us how to pray. That's what they're saying. Just like John taught disciples. We are your disciples. We're not just followers of Jesus. We want to be, we are disciples. And therefore, being students and disciples, we need to know how to pray. Okay? So this scripture we're looking at here, which we call the Lord's Prayer, it's not the prayer per se. Yeah, it's a prayer, but it's really how to pray. It's really principles of prayer. It's principles of prayer that you see in the Lord's Prayer. Okay? Now, sometimes if you if you grew up in, in, in church religious circles, you might not have ever heard this or seen this. This scripture here, what we call the Lord's Prayer, is not, it's not a prayer by per se. It is, but it's not. It's really about teaching them how to pray. Okay, there are principles in this, uh, in this what we call the Lord's Prayer that when we learn them, or let me say different elements of prayer. That's what I really want to say. When we learn them and look at, we will begin to gain more understanding and also we'll know how to pray more effectively. Okay, so let's. Um, I'm gonna 
kind of read through it and then I might just mention one or two because we have the whole month to actually work on understanding prayer. Now, and he said to them, verse 2 now, when you pray, say, I always emphasize this, prayer is not thinking. Prayer is conversational. If, you have to, if I have to define prayer, I would define prayer as conversation. Okay? Conversation between God and man. Through which, or a vehicle, a medium of conversation, through which God and man, through which we express our praise, we express our repentance, we express our commitment, we express our intercession, we express our petitions to God. Okay? It's a communication vehicle through which we express our praise, our repentance, our intercession, our requests. Okay? We express all that to God. That's prayer. Okay? That's important. And our commitment also. We express that that's what prayer is. And on the other end, also, because it's communication, prayer is also God impressed in our hearts. Okay? His response. Remember, God is a spirit. And therefore, God does not speak to us necessarily in human terms. He speaks to us in our hearts. Okay? He speaks to us in our hearts. There, there, there is definite assurance of God when we pray. There's God speaking to us in our hearts and giving us a thumbs up and assurance that, yes, I've heard you. You know, there's that assurance in our heart that tells us that. And that's important. Oftentimes, we don't understand that. And therefore, here's what many of us do. We, are, we, we jump to pray, quote unquote, and it's not wrong with that, we pray, but we don't wait for that response. We don't wait for that answer. We don't wait for that assurance in our heart and we walk away from there. Now, do I need to have an assurance all the time? Not necessarily. You know, why do I say so? Because when I pray according to God's will, God hears me. You know, God has heard me. It's according to his will. And therefore, I don't necessarily need to hear him say, I've heard you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I don't necessarily need to. Because the word already tells us that he has heard us. When we pray according to his will. First John 5 tells us that. When we pray according to his will, he hears us. And we know we have the petition that we question of him. So when I pray already, I mean, so let, let's say a little bit. Let's go back here. So when you pray, say. When you pray, say. So I said prayer is conversational. Okay? We must say. And God has said in his word. Okay? When you look at the scriptures, that's all of that is God speaking. So now, when I come to God in prayer, I'm going to come to God in, remember we said it's a medium of communication, it's got to be what is common to both of us. Okay? It has to be the language that's common to both of us. And what's the language that's common to both of us? The language of God's word. The scriptures define, give us the parameters for prayer. Give us parameters for what the will of God is. So when I come to God in prayer, effective prayer then involves speaking to God, communicating with God, in accordance with his word, in line with his word, because his word is his language. His word is his language. God speaks to us in his word. That's what I mean. Or by his word or through his word, whatever you want to use. In his word, by his word, through his word, that's how God speaks to us. Therefore, the word of God is God's language. So if I'm going to speak back to God, I'm going to speak back to him within the terms of his language. Okay, I'm going to speak back to him in accordance with his In fact, let's look at First John 5, because I, I, I've, I mentioned it, but I want us to look at it. First John 5, let's look at it. Verse 14, verse 14, First John 5, 14. Okay, First John 5, verse 14. Look at what it says there. It says, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Let, let me read this from the King James. Let me go to Amplified on this. Let me go to Amplified. Because I really want to, I want this to kind of, uh, uh, I want this to settle in your heart and in your mind. Okay? First John chapter 5 verse 40. I'm reading from the Amplified version. It says, this is a remarkable degree of confidence which we as believers are entitled to have before him. Okay? Because it says, the remarkable degree of confidence that we as believers are entitled to have before him. That if we ask anything, According to his will, what this that is consistent with his plan and purpose, he hears us. Okay, if we ask anything according to his will that is consistent with his plan and purpose, he hears us. In John 17 17, he said, Sanctify them with thy truth, thy word is truth. Okay, God's word and God's will are interchangeable. His word and his will are interchangeable. 
Therefore, when we pray according to his will, according to his word, the Bible says he hears us. Okay? And, okay, um, according to his will, he, he, that is consistent with his plan and purpose, he hears us. He hears us. Present perfect sense. So that means that if I'm going to pray effectively, it's going to be within the confines of the word of God. Because God's word is God's language. That's how God speaks to us. Okay? So if I pray not in alignment with his word or his will, guess what I'm doing? I'm speaking a, I'm speaking a different language, a foreign language to God. And therefore, God will not hear you. I mean, by inference. Now, some of them might say, well, God is God. God hears everybody. I hear you. But God who is God, according to you, hears everybody. God has said in his word, this is how I hear you. <laughs> So what you're trying to do, in essence, is now become God over God. God, this is how you must hear me. No. God has said, look, the way I hear you is when you pray in alignment with my word, when you pray in my will. Okay? I don't hear you when you pray in alignment with how you feel about things, how you think things should be. You know, God is not obligated to you. You are not God. I'm not God. God is not obligated to me. God is God all by himself. Okay? His name is El, the one who is the all-sufficient one. He doesn't need any aid or support. That's God, El. Okay? He doesn't need any aid or support. El, you know, El Shaddai, El. You know, the word El there means he needs no aid, no support. And that's God. Okay? You got to understand that. So what do you do? Look at the principles of his word. What has he said in his word? He says here, when you pray in alignment, in accordance with my plan and purpose, with my word, or okay, with my will, I will hear you. And simple logic means that if you pray not in alignment with his word or his will, he does not hear you. You're speaking a foreign language. <laughs> Maybe that's why sometimes prayers are not answered because people are speaking foreign languages. Are they speaking? Yes. Are they quote unquote praying? Yes. But they're not praying in alignment to God's will, plan, and purpose and his word. Therefore, God is not paying attention to them. Okay? All right. And if we know, look at the next verse now. And if we know for a fact, as indeed we do, that he hears and listens to us in whatever we ask, we also know with certain and absolute knowledge that we have, we have granted to us the request which we have asked from him. I mean, it's a follow-up on that. If I know God has heard me, then I know for a fact that I've, that I've got the answer. Now, the answer might not manifest physically immediately, does not mean the answer has not been given. It's not the answer is yes. It's not yes. Sorry. For, let me give you a good example. Okay? I have children. Okay, my daughter comes and says, Daddy, I need a new pair of shoes. Okay? And I say, okay. All right? Now, I didn't get the shoes immediately. Does not mean I'm not going to get the shoes. I didn't get the shoes today. Does not mean I'm not going to get the shoes. I didn't get the shoes tomorrow. Does not mean my answer has changed. My answer is yes. For us as human beings, there might be, there might be um, uh, uh, obstacles. Excuse me. There might be some, some things that we need to take care of. Shoe store might be on the other side of town. I'm not going to the other side of town until, you know, next week or whatever, you know, whatever the case may be. Now, on the God side of the equation, let me, I'm going to say this quickly. I'm going to say this clearly. Many times, okay, uh, I'm using one many times, and I, because there are many other factors. Many times, the things we're asking God to do for us, okay, depend on other people's obedience. Let me let me give you a practical example. I'm praying for increase in my finances. Now, and I'm a businessman. For that to happen, other factors have to line up. Okay? There are things that have to come in alignment for that to happen. There are other players, other people, other parties in that whole equation for that to happen. The important thing is the answer is increased income. It's not necessarily the processing of how it works. So my part is to say, Lord, I've prayed in accordance in alignment with your will. Therefore, I know you've answered me. So I'm going to go about life like somebody expecting something great to happen, as it were, but with the confidence that God has answered me. So if something happens that is not great, I'm not going to say, oh, God did not answer. Or if there's doubt coming to my mind, you know, the devil try and sow doubt in your mind and, you know, fear and all that stuff. Supposing, maybe, how about if? <laughs> That's our devil. Supposing, maybe, how about if? Uh, maybe not, you know. All that stuff. Doubts and from fear and unbelief and questioning and all that. Okay. So all the things coming, 
to and if I say to derail my faith. But if I understand and look, I've prayed in accordance with God's will. I've spoken God's language. Therefore, God has heard me and answered me. And the answer is yes. Then I can move around with confidence. So going back to the Lord's Prayer, he said, when you pray, say. When you pray, say. It's very, very important. It's very important. Now, I know I've, I've explained this before, but I, I, I feel I need to explain it again in the context of this. Um, I need to explain it again in the context of, of this message. Okay? When we speak words, we are speaking um, one second when we speak when we speak words okay we are we are expressing our will jesus said out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaking my will my desire what i want to see what i'm convinced about what i'm driven by my passions okay i'm speaking my passions my desire my will i'm speaking what i want so that's why the Bible says that when we pray, say. That's why there is, you know, that, yeah. Give me a second. Excuse me. Okay. Now, so when I'm praying, so when I'm when I'm praying, and when I'm speaking in prayer, I'm actually expressing myself and expressing my heart desire okay i've i've come out of i've made a conclusive uh uh prayer as a conclusive statement that's the word i've made conclusion i'm convinced and i've said this things as a measure of your your words are your spiritual signature that's how i put it yes your words are your spiritual signature now very important your words are your spiritual are your are your spiritual signature think about it if somebody gives you a document and says, okay, we're, we're doing a, a, a contract, a purchase contract, and all that, you're about to purchase this car, and you say, yes, okay? Now, and you don't sign the documents, guess what? That car is not coming home with you because you need to sign the documents. Please, listen very carefully. This is important. You, you said yes to them, but you've not put signature in it. Here's what many of us do. We say yes in our hearts, but we don't put the signature of our mouth. Okay? You say yes to healing. You say yes to prosperity. You say yes to holiness. You say yes to prayer. You say yes to Bible reading. You say yes to, 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 to soundness of, of mind emotionally, but you never put your mouth on it. Now, you don't put your mouth, when I say put your mouth on, put your mouth involved, engage your mouth, that's what I mean. You don't engage your mouth. What does that mean? It means that when you engage your mouth, you are signing, you are putting your signature on it. So not engaging your mouth, okay, means you are not putting your signature. And therefore, just like that person who has a car, you can't take that car home. Even though you like the car, even though you have agreed they want the car, even though you have, quote unquote, in your heart, you have said yes, but you have not put your signature on. And not putting your signature on does not allow you to take that car home. That's how it is also in the spirit. In the spirit, your heart, it's like your mouth telling the, the car dealership yes. Okay? But your signature, your hand, your pen in hand and signing is actually what delivers the car to you. In the spirit, or spiritually speaking, it's your heart that says yes, okay? But your mouth is the signature. The Bible says with the heart, man believes unto righteousness. But with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. You can believe unto righteousness, okay? Believe unto righteousness, great. Many people do. If you ask people on the streets or anywhere, do you believe that Jesus Christ died, okay, for your sins? Oh, yes, I believe, okay? But have you confessed him as Lord and Savior? That's the other part of it. Okay, they believe Christ died. He died for our sins. It was, you know, the Lamb of God. They believe many people know the biblical story. They can even explain it to you very well. But they have never put their mouth. They have never signed their signature with their mouth, and therefore they are not born again. As much as they might believe in their heart, but they are not putting their mouth in what they are engaging their mouth in. It. Okay, so that's important. So when it says, when you pray, say. The reason why is God wants you to engage this 
with your mouth. Engage, complete the commitment with your mouth. Complete the commitment with your mouth. Now, do you have to shout in prayer? Maybe. Do you have to whisper in prayer? Maybe. The important thing is speak. Speak. I can be speaking silently under my breath, quote unquote, okay? And you don't hear the words, but I'm speaking. I can be praying silently under my breath. You don't hear the words, but I'm praying. I don't have to open my mouth and yell and scream, and I'm not against that. Because there are times that prayer requires you to be very vocal and let me use the word aggressive. <laughs> let, let's 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 I mean let's examine that for a minute. Think about this. Okay. Think about the parent whose child is three years old and the child happens to be going towards danger. What do you do? You shout, you yell, you scream. Okay? You shout, so screaming, shouting, yelling, you know, and all that is an emotional expression in that moment to address and arrest that situation. So also, spiritually speaking, there are times that in prayer, we have to address and arrest something with a level of aggression and force, and therefore, that might require us to pray, if I'll say, uh, out loud, but very uh, uh, intensely, with a higher decibel, <laughs> okay, you know. So there's nothing wrong with that. But there's also nothing wrong with somebody who is maybe, I'm in a bus, um, I'm in a car, in an Uber, you know, so I'm at work, I'm among people in a public place, and I want to pray. Okay, I don't want to have to bow down my head in the office and pray, you know. And I'm just there. I'm not doing anything, quote unquote. So it's not like I'm stealing, quote unquote, I'm not stealing company time. You know? but I, can be on, I can be on my desk and begin to and, and address the situation in prayer. I can just be there. I'm going to give you an example now. I was praying right there. You didn't hear my words. If you look at my lips, you saw them probably moving slightly, but I was praying. Okay? So, they said, Jesus said to them, when you pray, go back to Luke 11. Let's go back there. Luke 11. Let's go back there. Luke Excuse me, chapter 11, verse 2. Okay. When you pray, say, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Hmm. This is interesting. Okay. okay. Father, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Now, I, let me address this. The first part there. And, you know, um, the other part that we'll do with the difference, I will start unpacking it, you know, uh, um, in our next class. I think I'm going to, yeah, I think I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of show you the different elements of prayer, different types of prayer in this scripture. But let me just deal with that part there for the next about, about, about 12 more minutes or so. Okay. It says, our father, which art in heaven, hallowed be, no, which art in heaven, our father. Our Father. Now, this is the King James. The Amplified puts it a little differently. The Amplified just says, Father, hallowed be thy name. The kingdom come. Let me see what the NIV says. The NIV says, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. Okay, so let's look at the um, NLT. Father, may your name be kept holy. So, the, the, the Bible here, from what it looks like, I'm looking at our translations, all it looks like here, the King James what I emphasize which art in heaven. I mean it doesn't really, you know, every every other other translations don't emphasize that. I'm just I'm looking at different translations in the Bible. You know, yeah. Even the, the Darby says when you pray, say, Father, thy name be hallowed. So okay. Okay. Let me see the ESV. Sorry, just doing a little <laughs> Father Hallowed be thy name. So everybody else, nobody else but the King James is what that says our Father which art in heaven. You know, hallowed be thy name. That's why it's only the King James that does that. Nobody else does that. Um, nobody else does The King James does. Father, hallowed be thy name. I've, I've checked all the translations. I can tell you that I don't see any other one that says which art 
good news translation. Give me a second. Let's just see what the good news is. Uh, Father, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom be so. So everybody else it emphasizes, just does not mention that uh, which art in heaven. Okay. So let's let's we can therefore uh, we can I don't want to say ignore it, but we can we're not going to emphasize it this morning. Let's just look at the father part. The interesting thing is that the New Testament, okay, which began with Jesus' death on the cross, okay, and let me say technically start with the birth of Christ, okay, introduced to us a different concept of God. Jesus' advent, Jesus coming to the world, introduced to us a different concept. The Bible says, unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. Unto us, Isaiah 9, a child is born. Unto us a son is given. Not unto heaven, but unto us. So the purpose of Jesus coming as a, as a child, as a son, is for us, is for our benefit. It's unto us that a child, but unto us a son is given. What does that mean? If there's a son, there's equally a father. If there's a son, there's a father. If there's a child, there's a parent. If there's a son, there's a father. Okay. Jesus said, our father. Now, when Jesus said those words, in, when he just expressed those words, they caused a lot of uh, confusion and angst. If you look at John chapter 5, in fact, let's look at it. John chapter 5. John chapter 5. Glory to God. Glory, glory, glory. I, let me pull out the right verses. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. So when G, let me quickly say this as I find scripture. When Jesus said this, when Jesus said to them, <laughs> Father, the Jews of that time wanted to stone Jesus to death. Now, okay, good. Uh, John chapter uh, 5, verse 17. I'm going to read to verse uh, 19. And there's so much I can read here, but I just to stick to time, to work with time, and stick to the context. But Jesus answered them, My Father do work it, either to and I work. Look at verse 18, very important. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he had not only broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. You see that? He said God was his father, making himself equal with God. So they wanted to stone him. Okay? So he committed blasphemy. That's what they are saying. He called, him, he called God his father. And if God is his father, then he is the son of God. And that is blasphemous because that means that he has the nature of the father, he has the authority of the father, he has all of the, because that's what happens with, with sons. When when somebody is a, a particular the first son, he has the authority of the father. I mean, those is that give the child a signet ring, and whenever the child or the son, rather, not child, but the son, whenever the son goes somewhere, if he dips that ring in wax and stamps it on, that becomes like a signature, a seal authorizing that thing. If he says, I want this car, you know, and all that, if you just do that signet ring, okay, that with his father's signature on it, and he just ink, put in ink and stamp on it, boom. That's where we got the concept of, of ink stamping from. Okay. When that is done, that immediately verifies that look, this is as though the father himself was there. So when he said that, when they said here, sorry, that he said God was his father. Make himself equal with God. Make himself equal with God. Hmm, that's important. So, so basically, when in the within the Jewish culture, Jewish mindset, when you say God is your Father, you are making yourself, you are claiming equality with God. But it's interesting, though. Didn't God say in Genesis chapter, chapter one, "Let's make man in our image and after our likeness"? Okay, let them have dominion. That means God's original intent was that we will be like him, will function like him. We'll be, we are his offspring, and therefore we are, you know, and all that, I mean, uh, and therefore we'll, we'll, uh, we'll function like him. We have his DNA, okay? Now, I understand there's a natural aspect to it, spiritual aspect to it. When we're born again, reborn, we're born again, we become sons of God. John 1, 12, as many as received them, received him, sorry, he gave them power, the right to become sons of God. First, that's John chapter 1, verse 12. Let's look at it. John chapter 1, verse 12. John, we're in John already. So go chapter 1 and look at verse 12. It says that, but as many as received him, 
to them gave he the power or right to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born, what this, not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. So this birth is talking about here. It's not a natural birth. It makes it very clear here. Okay, he, uh, that when we believe on his name, when we receive him, he says that well, he gives us the right, the power, the ability to become sons of God. And he said this did not come by natural birth. So it's important we understand that. So when Jesus said, "Our Father," when you pray, say, "Our Father," what I mean, what's he saying? He said, "You are a part of a family." He says, you, and also you have the nature of your father. Okay. The same things that were said of Jesus when he said this in John chapter 5 is the same thing that should be said of us. That you're making yourself equal with God. You're thinking you're better than everybody. You know, you must have heard that before. You think you're better than everybody. You think you are you're all that. You think you're all the most holy one. All those type of things. Well, it, guess what? It's true. <laughs> you don't have to think it. It's true. You're a child of God. Hallelujah. Like father, like son. Glory to God. But guess what? I have a son. My son is growing up into maturity. He's growing up into sonship in that sense. He's my son, yes, but he doesn't understand things. He's learning. As he's learning, guess what? He's growing into them. Glory. Just like you. You're not perfect either. You know, you're not celestially perfect. You know, God is working on you. But guess what? You are a son that is growing into so don't don't ever make yourself feel, oh, what I did is so bad. I don't deserve to be called. The prodigal, that's what the guy did. Okay? He, he, I mean, he he ran home, came home and told the father, I don't deserve to be called your son. The father ignored all that stuff because the father's like, ah, I understand. You're going through, you've gone through a hard time, you're emotional, you feel bad, you feel I understand how you feel, but that is never gonna happen. I'm not what is called your son. Make me your servant. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> the servants of God are angels. Glory to God. Hallelujah. No matter what you and I ever do, we should never, let me word, degenerate to the point where we're saying, Lord, I'd rather just be an angel <laughs> than be a son. No, 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 no. No, you're a member of the household of God. Hallelujah. You're a member of the household of God. You're growing up in Him. You're growing up into Him. Glory. You're growing up into the fullness of Jesus Christ. You're growing up in maturity. Now, when you grow up, you might make a mess. But making a mess does not make you throw in the baby. <laughs> Think about it. You know, you have a baby, and the baby makes a mess. I don't care how bad the mess is. If the baby, if the mess messed up the whole bed and all that stuff, if you did all that, listen, uh, the mess came on you. <laughs> it's happened, if your parents it's happened to you before, your child, you know, does the whatever, and it's on you. Or maybe your child pees and... <laughs> You don't take the baby and say, ew, mm, throw in the baby. <laughs> you don't do that. You don't do that. You don't throw in the baby. You don't say, this is, ew, what, how could you have done this? You stinky, stinky little whatever. I'm going to throw you away. You don't do that. Because the child is growing up. So also, spiritually speaking, God does not say, oh, how could you have done this? Shame on you. Shame, shame, shame. I'm ashamed of you. I'm disgusted by you. I don't want you no more. You're going to blah, blah, blah. Let me toss you away. No, don't ever allow the devil to tell you that crap. That's lying from being of hell. You are a son of God. You are growing up in him. You are growing up into him. Hallelujah. You might make mistakes. In fact, let me say this. I'm sorry to burst your bubble. You will make mistakes. <laughs> and that's not giving you permission to. When I say that, I'm not saying, oh, yes, go ahead and make mistakes. No, no, no. I'm just speaking truthful facts. So that way, whenever you find yourself in that situation, don't say God has forgotten about me. Don't listen to the devil and say, let me run away and run to your way. Instead, be like the prodigal. Come home. Don't say, oh, Lord, I don't serve to your servant. Don't say that. Simply say, Father, thank you for the blood of Jesus. Thank you for mercy. <laughs> thank you because you have, you, have, you have provided mercy and I take it now for this nonsense I just did. Lord, I'm sorry I messed up, but I just take your mercy right now. In the name of Jesus. See, that's important. You need to show remorse and, and not acknowledge, I messed up. Lord, I'm sorry, I messed up. You know, now, uh, Lord, I, I, I receive your mercy. And also strength by the Holy Ghost. Strength by God, the grace of God to enable me to live above this thing. You know, above this sin, above this mess up, above this situation. 
all that. So it's important we understand that. Okay, but I'm saying that because you are a member of the family. You are a member of the household of God. Your membership in the family is not predicated on your own. Now, listen, I'm not, oh gosh, I, I need to quickly say this. Lord Jesus, help me. This is not an endorsement of sinful behavior. Okay, This is not a permission <laughs> of sinful behavior either. This is just a factual statement. We're not in heaven yet. <laughs> We're not in heaven. We're all going through the process of maturity and growth and perfection and all that. We're all growing, growing. The word perfect in the Bible is mature. It's maturing. Okay? The Bible says we should be perfect. That means we should be maturing. That's what it actually means. It doesn't mean perfect like sinless. There's nothing you, you, you always cross every T, dot every I. No, but it's maturing. That means growing, growing, growing. Hallelujah. Growing. I mean, God told Abraham, God said, walk before me and be perfect. What does it say? As long as you're walking before me, as long as you're walking with me, as long as you're walking with me, God is saying, you will be perfecting. You will be perfect. What is that? You will be maturing. That's what it means. Okay? You will be maturing. Glory to God. The same Abraham, after God told him all that, he went to sleep with Hagar. Same Abraham lied about his wife being his sister. All that stuff. Yeah, God did not toss him away in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we are sons of God. Now, 1 John 3, 1. Now are we sons of God. Our citizenship is in heaven. Amen. Hallelujah. Then you got born, you became a child of God. Are you hearing me? You became a son of God. Glory to God. All the inheritance that Christ died for belongs to you. Listen, they are not predicated upon your spiritual maturity. And let me say that again. The inheritance you have in Christ, the blessings you have in Christ, Healing, prosperity, peace, holiness. I mean, you go on. They are not predicated upon your obedience. It's not, oh, when I've obeyed, then I can become healed. When I've obeyed, I can become prosperous. Then if that's the case, we're in trouble. Then God is really not being truthful. Because unbelievers who are not serving God, trying to serve God at all, they are doing well financially. Okay, some of them do well financially. If holiness was the was was the was the uh, uh, basis for financial prosperity, then the unbelievers who are not serving God, they are holy. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They must be very holy. Then it's not. It's not. You are a child of God. You have an inheritance. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Bible says Jesus was made poor for you, so that you become rich. It's your inheritance. It's part of your inheritance package. Hallelujah. So no matter where you are in the growth curve, spiritual maturity curve, all these things belong to you. Okay? That's why the Bible says to us, we are children of God and we are sons of God at the same time. We are children of God and sons of God. Children of God, how are we children? We are maturing. That's what children mean. Somebody who is maturing, technon. Somebody who is mature, who is being taught, who is growing. A child is called technon in the Greek. Okay? Somebody who is growing. But at the same time, we are sons. Hallelujah. We are sons. Now are we. We are sons of God. Romans 8 tells us that we are joint as with Christ. We are sons of God. That means that every inheritance belongs to us regardless of our spiritual growth or spiritual development, the curve where we are. We are sons. All that Jesus Christ died for us, died, belongs, died for, belongs to us. Hallelujah. So when we pray, Jesus said, our Father, our Father. Our Father or my Father. Glory to God. He was talking to them plural when you pray. Plural. But personal. My Father. Daddy. Glory. <laughs> Daddy. Make it personal. Abba. Glory to God. Abba. Okay, that's actually the word Jesus said. He was Abba. Which is like when a child tries to speak, express their, uh, express, uh, uh, communicate with their father. The child in those in 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 the in the in their culture, the child will say Abba. It's a loving expression of a child to a father, and that's what it is. He did not say master. He did not say master. He said father. Jesus specifically did not say master because Moses, Moses, the Lord, the Bible says, came through Moses. But in John chapter one, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Moses' relationship with God was that of a servant and a master. The Old Testament was more of a master-servant type dynamic in the Old Testament. Okay, God said, if you look at Trumpet 28, if you diligently obey all the, all the blessings will come upon you. It's not Trumpet 28. If you diligently do this, all blessings will come upon you. 
So the blessings coming upon you in the Old Testament were predicated on you diligently obeying all these things. Okay? But in New Testament, those blessings are yours because you are in Christ. Ephesians 1 3. He has blessed you with all spiritual blessings, uh, blessings, heavenly blessings in Christ. And you are in Christ. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. He's a new creation. If you are in Christ, and therefore, when you are in Christ, all the blessings in Christ belong to you. I want this my guy to go. <laughs> all the blessings that are in Christ belong to you. They are not based or they are not predicated on spiritual maturity. Just because, just the fact that you're a member of the family, these things belong to you. To our Father, or oh, my Father, or oh, Daddy. <laughs> when you pray, Jesus said, have the perspective of coming to Father, not to Master. Not to Master. Don't come in prayer with the mindset of, you know, uh, wages. Because Master means I have to work to get paid. It's about wages. If I don't work right, I don't get paid right. Okay? Therefore, my ability to receive from my master, from my boss, is based on my performance. So when you come to God, come family, father. Come as a child, father. Understand that a father loves the children. A master does not have to love you. A master just does what they have to do. A boss, they might not like you. I all like your guts, but you get the job done, therefore they like you for that for what you do. But fatherhood and sonship and you know family is family love. It has nothing to do with performance. It's when you come to God in prayer, come with that perspective, Father. Now, let me quickly say this to kind of balance out that part as we, as we close. Because you are a son of God, because you are a child, you want to do what pleases your father. See? And therefore, you know, hey. Father wants me to live this way, okay? Call the fruit of the Spirit. Doesn't want me to lie or fornicate or, or have hatred in my heart or, you know, or smoke or you know, get influenced by, by, uh, uh, by drugs, you know, uh, have wrong friends, you know, be sick, be poor, be broke, be depressed, you know, go on and on and on. I know fathers don't want that. So what am I going to do? I'm going to make sure that I apply scriptures and yield to the Holy Spirit and all that so I can grow into all of those things. That's because I want to please my father. Okay? I want to please my father. You see what I'm saying? So it's not about, I'm not earning approval. I'm already approved. I'm a child of God. He's one who has brought me into the body of Christ. When I open his arms unto me, Jesus said, no man can come to the father except he's drawn. Okay? He has drawn me. He has drawn the world. And I've responded to his wound. Therefore, acceptance is already there. But now it's about growing in my walk with him, growing in my walk with him, growing my walk with him, but also knowing that I'm a son. And the inheritance, the blessings of God are mine. So when I come in prayer, I don't come beggarly. I don't come as a beggar. I don't come as a servant. I don't come as, uh, I don't come with, with this woe is me mentality. I come as a son. Even when I err, I still come as a son. Okay? Sons take responsibility. Daddy, I blew it. I messed up. I messed up. I mean, I'm sorry, Daddy. I'm sorry. You know, sons take responsibility. Okay? True sons take responsibility. So when you see a Christian who's always not trying to take responsibility for, I mean, I'm not saying you should go out and walk out, oh, see what I've done, oh. No, 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 no. Because when you acknowledge your sin, it's, you know, it's basically, it's only been X'd out in the blood of Jesus. <laughs> You're just taking the blood, as it were. You're just taking a hold of what you need to address this situation. Okay? When we, when we acknowledge our sin, we're taking uh, 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 responsibility. Okay? I messed up here. It's like, okay, I have a table in front of me right now. If this table was all clean and I messed up a part of this table here, okay, the table, the destiny of this table is to be clean. But then what do I do? I'm responsible to take a cloth and clean it and just clean, take off the dirt so that the cleanness stays right there. That's what it is. So when a person, a believer, you know, messes up and says, Lord, I blew it, you know, I, I messed up, I sinned, you know, I acknowledge it, I'm sorry, but thank you for the blood of Jesus that takes care of my sin, that has already paid the price for this sin debt. You see, that's what you do. You're taking responsibility because you want to grow. It's a growth, a confession of sins, let me say in quotes, it's not about, it's not a religious thing, it's a growth thing, it's an accountability thing, but that's what we do, okay? We want to please the Father, we want to stay pleasing the Father, amen? <laughs> well, time up. <laughs> I said 45 now. This is exactly 
about 15 minutes or so of teaching. We're going to continue the month of throughout the month of September dealing with understanding prayer. Don't miss any session. It's a whole series, the whole month. Okay, don't miss any session. I guarantee you it will be a blessing. On Thursday, we're going to be back here. Now we're going to be jumping into looking at different things about, we're just going to kind of skim through the Lord's Prayer. I'm not going to go real in there. What we call the Lord's Prayer, that is. I'm not going to go in there, but I want to show you different elements of prayer in that, what we call the Lord's Prayer. I want to show you different, different types of prayer in there. Okay, just show them to you. And then in the month, we're going to unpack them one by one and take some time to dig in. Amen. So let's get ready, man. It's going to be, a, it, it, look, the table is set. It's a big spread. Believe you me, it's a big spread. The table is set. All kinds of real nice, juicy, sweet, sumptuous, healthy stuff on the table for you. <laughs> but Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. They eat bread in those days. Now we eat veggies. We eat all those things. So it's all set up. <laughs> your smoothie, your spiritual smoothie is set up here. Your veg, your fruit is set up here. Your carbs and all that is all set up. So in the month of September, I want to encourage you, make sure don't miss any session. Hallelujah. And also share with somebody else. If this message has been a blessing to you, please do me a favor, share with somebody else. And also, if you you know want to sow a seed, please do that. Cash app, dollar sign, fount of life. If you want to do it, you can send us a, a lot of offering on cash app using dollar sign, fount of life. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us this Sunday as we begin of this mess, I trust that God's goodness, God's mercy, God's favor is on you. Hallelujah. Go and enjoy this week. Enjoy it. Enjoy walking the fullness of it. Hallelujah. By the help of the Holy Ghost. And you will enjoy it. I promise you, you have testimonies of God's favor and God's goodness. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today. Thank you for this service. Thank you, Father, for speaking to us, for teaching us. Lord, I pray even as we, as we have received these words, that you help us to put them into practice by the Holy Ghost. Help us not to be hearers, but to doers of this word. Thank you, Father God, in Jesus' name. Amen. It's been a joy and delight being with you this Sunday morning. Um, again, I'm a personal Bible teacher. I'm the normal fountain of life international. Until we get together again on Thursday, 7 p.m., I want to of God's word. Till then, be blessed. Have a lovely Labor Day weekend. Don't eat on too much ribs. Leave some for me. <laughs> Thank you again. Be blessed.